Hey, Steph, how's it going? Perfect. How are you, man? I'm good, thanks. I guess I did something right because you're here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I used to uh, always fumble the beginning because I didn't know I had to request access, but we're now a, you're an expert. a little bit more savvy. <laughs> <laughs> what time is it? Uh, what time is it there? It's uh, 7 p.m. All right. So I'm having a beer. Nice. As we well, do in Belgium. <laughs> I'm having a ha having a coffee. Um, it's 10 a.m. here. So thanks for thanks for making time. No worries, no worries. I'm happy to geek out about this stuff every time, anytime. Awesome. Hey, I have one question since you're an expert. Do you know uh, if this will record automatically or uh, if I have to hit something to record it? You you can just push it to IG Live or make a post out of it after. So you don't have to record anything. Awesome. I think so. People in the audience, let me know if I'm wrong, but I, I, I have done this and usually it saves to your recording. So. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, I just, uh, I hope that for anyone who can't join, I can, can pull some clips out of this. So I don't, as I've said, like, I don't really have a, a big agenda. I just uh, selfishly wanted to get to chat with you one-on-one. -on -one, and I thought um, other people might enjoy hearing what, what you had to say and what we had to talk about. So, um, cool. yeah, I mean, and let's, let, let's dive in. I guess one of the questions I, I put out on, um, on my stories, like, does anyone have any questions for, for Steph, basically, or for either of us? And the, the one thing that came back a couple of times is people are really curious, uh, as am I, about your career path. So I guess I, I wanna ask a little bit about that. Like, how long have you been doing branding? Not, not brand strategy, but just like, how, how long have you been in kind of the branding world, would you say? Yeah, I rolled into it, I think about 12 years ago. Maybe it's a little bit longer now. Once you get older, time starts stretching <laughs> in a weird way. So I have, it's, a, it's about a decade and a little bit before that. Okay. Where I just got into like graphic design. I did a lot of motion design and, and also logo design, but also web design. Like I, I basically did everything, but it, I sucked at it really badly. Uh, but yeah, gradually I started honing in on what I loved the most was working with brands. Uh, hey, the truth, Quarry. How are you? And um, yeah, that's how I rolled in. So about a decade. So were you formally? Did you have a formal design training, or or did you just? I I I had. I went to art school. Okay. Um, yeah, <laughs> Jill says my three D work was. A <laughs> Jill was a colleague. Uh, I went to art school. Um, and yeah, that's where I learned. There was more like multimedia arts, the direction. So I learned a little bit of code, a little bit of design, a little bit of 3D, a little bit of video, a little bit of everything basically. But what I did learn from that art school was really like the more conceptual thinking, which has helped me. Yeah. So, okay. So then explain a little bit about your uh, transition to start thinking about strategy. I mean, when did you realize that brand strategy was a thing or that it was important or that maybe you could or should be doing it? And, and tell us how that. Worked. Yeah. So at a certain point, like I, I think we all, everybody at, at our team was a little bit frustrated with how things were like, we were doing a lot of different things, like a lot of different deliverables and outputs focused and, and also pricing was a little bit frustrating. And so I started thinking about how can we improve like the briefing stage a little bit more. And so that's why I got into doing workshops. I used to call those like story workshops or something like that. And like I started doing that immediately. We felt a lot of results, like the workshops were really good. And we started to think a lot, a lot broader about different outputs. And we also got to charge more because we looked at it from a broader perspective. And at that point I was calling it like storytelling or something. But then I read this book, which the one that's like on my thumb here, branding in five and a half steps by um, Michael Johnson. Johnson. Yeah. Michael Johnson, very great book, very simple, very like very clear. And like those six questions that the framework that was in that book was already like almost what I came up on with on my own just by like deducting this. But then I realized what I was really starting to do was maybe brand strategy or at least a little bit more about branding. And then I started really honing in on that. And then the workshops 
went a little further. I started doing research. I started like evaluating, validating the things we learned in the workshop. And I really started not just facilitating, but really shaping the direction of what we were going to do. And that's, that gradually evolved. And, and that's where like today I'm, I'm really a brand strategist, quote unquote. Yeah. You said your team was, was frustrated. Is that your company or a company you were employed by at the time? I, I started a little like studio together with my brother. Okay. And then some people joined like uh, Gilles, who was in the chat here. And yeah. I think at a certain point we were like maybe six, nine people, maybe even 10 people, like some developers, some designers, some, some marketing people. But we were really like your small full service agency. And then at a certain point we did a rebrand towards um, Oli and we really refocused the whole company around this this like more core with uh, Gilles as like a designer and then me as a strategist and my brother as as um, the, the, the one running the business because I was always more of like in the company as an employee but I, I did start it together with my brother mm -hmm. but I always took the backseat of being more like an employee. I didn't take any financial risks but basically it grew <laughs> into funny. this more... Yeah, it grew into this more boutique branding studio, brand experience studio is what we called it at the end. And then last last year, we finally decided to split ways and everybody started doing their own thing. Got it. Okay, so the Michael Johnson book, which I think- Hey, Sam. I, I think that book, yeah, hey, Sam. Welcome back to Instagram, Sam. Um, <laughs> I, think, uh, I think that book is, is what, five or six years old? The Michael Johnson five and a half. Stuff. Yeah, yeah, it's okay. it's definitely definitely older. Yeah, probably like five, six, maybe seven, even. Yeah. Okay, so um, so since that book, and correct me if I'm wrong, but that was kind of uh, maybe your formal introduction to doing brand strategy in a more formal way. But it seems yep. to me like in that whatever it is, six or seven years, you've been on a pretty uh, steep trajectory of learning, right? And that's one of the main things I want yeah. to talk to you about. So talk to me a little bit about um, the big kind of the big inflection points or the big aha moments that you've had over the past yep. seven years and, and what what's kind of changed about how you do brand strategy since those early days. Yeah, a lot has changed. I mean, if I look back at those first days, like, I mean, I, I think I did a better job than before just by trying to understand but I, I wasn't doing brand strategy at that point I guess but one big point if we're talking about books was of course as you know how brands grow was like a book that was on my aunt's shelf for years and I looked at it and she's in she's in advertising and I was like what's what's this book about how brands grow like what is it I don't know yet like yeah. I at the at my at the peak of my Mount Stupid, I thought I I reached it. Like I was this. I don't know if you know the Dunning Kruger effect, yes. but it's like the amount of confidence you have goes really high up. Like in the first years, Mount Stupid, that was where I was. Like I read Marty Newmeyer, I met the branding books, I knew everything. Like there was nothing new, and then. I started reading how brands grow and other books and I fell into the Valley of Despair, right. which are probably still at right now. Maybe I'm starting to climb the slope of enlightenment slightly, but so how brands grow was probably a, one of the like biggest turning points in, in how I started approaching branding and strategy and, and marketing and all of those things. Okay. So, so Byron Sharp's book, How Brands Grow, uh, for those who don't know it, it's, yeah, I have it here. I didn't get it from my aunt, um, <laughs> but, uh, but I definitely have it in it. I have the, the blue it. one, but yeah. there's, there's a red one. That's the yeah. first one. Yeah, where is it? Uh, here we go. So, so tell me a little bit about like the impact it had on you. Um, and this is like promise, Byron yep. Sharp did not sponsor this, uh, this IG Live. <laughs> We're doing his work for him here, creating some uh, mental availability for his book. Um, exactly. It me, needs it. Tell me, <laughs> what, what was it uh, in the book that, that most, like if there were, I don't know, three things or something that, that had the most impact on you? And my next question is going to be, <laughs> like, how did it actually change what you did 
in yep. those workshops, or, you know, versus because I get that a lot of it could change your mindset. You have this aha moment of like, oh, I'm thinking about things differently now. But I, what I really want to get down to is like the brass tacks of, did you ask different questions in your workshops or, or what, what really changed uh, tangibly? Yep. Yeah. So um, first question, um, how, what was the first question again? I was thinking so <laughs> hard about the second question. Yeah. Yeah, I just and I just saw Truth Quarry saying uh, they're cracking up at your Mount Stupid comments. Very relatable. Yeah, we've all been on <laughs> we've all been on Mount Stupid, and and hopefully most of us uh, have already started descending it. Um, that's the only way. <laughs> that's the only way to uh, to move forward. Um, yeah, the first question is just like, what are the big three things or whatever they are? Okay. Have to be yeah. Three, let's kinda, yeah. Let's dive. Let's dive into that. Yeah. I think um, how brands grow is like an, a perspective on branding that is outside in, as in he looks at the real reserve results, like things you can measure, like market share, how many people buy, how much do they buy, how many times do they buy, like just the, the things you can really measure. Right. And he, he saw uh, at least like, not not just Byron Sharp, but the whole Ehrenberg Bus Institute, and there were people before him, and Jenny Romaniuk after him, who also did a lot of work. So it's not just Sharp, just so we know. Um, he saw that um, a couple of important things. The most important thing is the what they they call the double jeopardy law. Yeah, I forget it about all the time. Um, but what it really means is that if you look at the data, if you look at large data sets in any industry, you'll see that bigger brands have more, have more buyers, so more people buying them, that buy more often. Yeah. It's, very, it's very logical, it's double jeopardy, because why it's double jeopardy? There's two jeopardies here, there's two dangers for smaller brands. If you are small, you'll have less clients that will buy less often. This all sounds very logical and it, it sounds like there is nothing really that changes the whole world of branding. But then the question is, of course, what, what is driving this dynamic? Why do big brands have more people that are more loyal or like more, more repetitive often. in their purchase? Yeah. Because that's where we do get into branding. Marty Neumeyer will say people will love your brand, differentiate it, they'll love it, they'll become loyal fans, they'll become tribe members. Sharp says, basically, meaningful differentiation doesn't exist, or at least it's not perceivable in the data. It, the only thing that really shows in the data is that if you are physically and mentally available, which brand, big brands are more because they advertise more, because they're easily available more, all of those things, that means they'll get more people buying more often. So what that rep, what the, like, let's say the consequences are for branding is that we shouldn't focus as much on meaningful differentiation, meaning people buy you because they know why you exist, because they love you for some reason. And we should focus more on distinctiveness, distinctiveness being in some way being recognizable as your own being visually or auditory interesting in a way and being easily separated from the conquer uh, competition that's that's the the gist of the story and and just one more note because i could blabble on about this and we want to talk about repercussions for work but what i really like about sharp's work is that it's it's anchored in just basic human like behavior and, and psychology how our mind works is basically what he's saying is like people do not pay attention to brands as we would like them to people are like they have their own lives and brands do not play an important role and that is confirmed by a lot of like neuroscience for example when they measure the brain when we look at brands we do not see the same areas light up as we see when we see another human because that's what we often say. Like I'll go to Instagram now, check out all the carousels. It will say <laughs> brands are human, brands are be, like be more human. Yeah, exactly. Brand is meaning, brand is why. So he basically just 
destroys <laughs> this whole ID. And there, there's lots of caveats about it's not actually that he's destroying all of this stuff, but at least from what he's seeing, what what he's like, what he's describing from the data is a different perspective than what we see from the inside, from the branding peeps, let's say. Yeah, yeah. Okay, great. You just you just said a lot of stuff about how brands grow. And um, I know it's impossible to try to summarize uh, actually two books, not even just one, but two books in kind <laughs> of like 30 seconds. But, but I wanna talk about some of the kind of uh, the conclusions you, you, you kind of explained from, from like, here was the input, here was the output. So mm -hmm. double, let's start back where, where you started. So Double Jeopardy. Um, how do you get from double jeopardy to meaningful differentiation doesn't matter? Just, just walk me through that a little bit. Um, so again, the, the idea here is that for small brands, they're, they're kind of doubly fucked, right? <laughs> they, they have the <laughs> Sorry, Rob. Uh, sorry. Yeah, I, I just lost you for about this. After you said doubly fucked, Instagram just kind of <laughs> blocked you yeah, for a no, second. <laughs> it, was my it was just something with my phone. Sorry. So, um, okay. So one thing is they're, they're smaller. So uh, they are purchased by fewer people and they're purchased mm -hmm. less often. And so I guess the idea here is that one, one phrase you didn't use, but that people like to talk a lot about in branding is this idea of a niche brand that uh, it's okay if you're small, you can have this, you know, incredibly loyal following. Um, people talk about how, uh, you know, brands should be, a differentiated brand should be polarizing. It's okay if a bunch yep. of people hate you because other, that mean you know, that, that hopefully means that a bunch of other people will love you and you can just have yep. that small percentage of the market that just buys you all the time and they're perfectly loyal to you. They never go to the competitor. So- Hey, Mark. Uh, yeah, is that, I mean, I get that the niche brand thing is probably a bit overblown, right? Like, and, well, and even I, 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 yeah, go ahead. I, I just want to, because I think what you asked that question before you went off, like, th that's a really interesting one. Like, where do we go from double jeopardy to meaningful differentiation doesn't exist? Like, why is that? Why is that the case? And And the interesting is like, that's because the law-like behavior shows us that there are almost no exceptions to the rule. So what he means is Apple is not pushing above its weight mm -hmm. in terms of loyalty. And that is what all branding people say. I mean, they say Apple is so unique and they have their think different model and people subscribe to that model. And that's why they have people buying them. But the data shows that it's not the case. The data shows that Apple, its amount of loyalty is in line with its market share. And if Apple's market share drops, it loyalty drops. So th that's really, that's where it gets really interesting. I mean, it's just these law-like patterns that you can't avoid. Does that mean that that differentiation on its own is not helpful for organizations in turn or even for communicating? That's a whole different story. But it's just right. we do not see it reflected in how people buy. That's just the, the harsh reality of this. Well, we things. don't see it reflected in, 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 in a loyalty metric, right? It seems to me that it, it somewhat successfully blows a hole in this idea of loyalty. But... Mm -hmm. But, yep. that, but that kind of presumes that the goal of meaningful differentiation or to some degree the goal of branding is to drive loyalty, um, which is one goal, I suppose. But what about, um, I mean, every other goal of branding, right? Like uh, even, what? Exactly. Even, even being able to sell for a higher price, right? And, and I'm, by no means am I going to defend Apple here because I, I, I totally agree that I think, uh, you know, the I the strength of the Apple brand in some ways is, is exaggerated by branding peeps, as you would call them. But I think Apple has probably higher pro profit margins than some of its competitors. And maybe that is partly due to differentiation. Uh, you know, I, I, I guess it just feels to me a little one track to say, because of double jeopardy, the law, which, which I, you know, I get it. Um, 
that differentiation therefore doesn't matter. So I, I, again, is it that we're kind of glossing over it because we don't have time to, to read the whole book to everyone? Or do you feel like there's, you know, is there a logical disconnect there? I mean, I think that the problem is with, with the whole, the whole how brands grow is, is it's very descriptive, but it's not really prescriptive of how to br build brands and how to do things. And, and if you look back at how these brands started existing, very often it's because they had a very differentiating ID, but that, that was very often on the business level. Where, where I see a lot of a issues is where, where Brett, the moment branding people started talking about this whole strategy thing and about this meaning, they started to feel like they should own meaning. I, I literally saw um, a uh, post by, um, what's his name again? Matt Davis, a wonderful guy, um, who said like branding is the management of meaning. That's, that's his take. And the problem is like, I, I really believe that for most organizations, the meaning is, is really managed by often by the product and the business and how it's run and how we uh, interact with these things. And not always, I, I think it's really a long shot to say that we as branding people or even brand strategists are managing the meeting. I think that's a very tricky thing. And I think that's where Sharp really has this, this good point about just realizing that on, on the most important level. And, and that's why I wouldn't say Sharp is, is like in in a way um, devaluating branding on the opposite. What he's saying is like branding is actually a the most valuable asset for for a business in terms of like if you're distinctive, people will recognize you and buy you more easily. He's not saying anything about the fact that some brands are more differentiated or other. He's just describing what happens on on like an aggregate level. And I think that's that's just fair. And and again, like if we there, it's not just sharp. If we look at, for example, behavioral science, the fact that it's well established that ninety five percent of our decisions are being made unconsciously, system one, just yeah. automatically. Five percent are made is ra made rational. That means that meaning lives in that five percent, as in knowing why a brand exists and choosing for it is a rational decision, even if that's an emotional like benefit in a way. So that distinctiveness and, and that whole part plays the biggest role in that 95% where familiarity and like unconscious feeling is very important. So there's like a hybrid model that exists for me where, where a lot of truths that, that come from branding people still work but it's just that critical note of n not seeing everything to those goggles of meaning and differentiation. And I think that's, for me, that has been the big change. Yeah. Um, Flickstra is asking, what is the purpose of meaning? That's a very existential oh. question. What is the meaning of purpose or what is the purpose of meaning? You could ask. We, we need more beer. We need more beer, Flickstra. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, but but it's true. I, do you really need more meaning in your life? I mean, for me, if, if no, but really, like, if I wake up, I'm stressed about is is like is my kid gonna be okay? Is 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 my wife gonna be? Fix oh, I know you're not asking. It's a, but it's an interesting. Um, like, you, there's so much worries worries we have in our daily mind. Am I going up in my job? Am I alive? Am I healthy? And really, like, what we don't want to do is go into this deep tangent about each brand we have. Because if you really, and, and like, ask people, normal people, not branding people, this question, like, what pants are you wearing? What shoes are you wearing? And ask them one question about how it's positioned, what the purpose is, what the meaning is. And, like, for 99%, they'll always, they, they won't know. Yeah, it's the green thing. It's the blue thing. It's the thing I bought there. It's the... And that's normal. And like, I I love the 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 like the humility the humility we can have as branding people that just because they saw something in their the corner of their eye that they saw a few times and it was like the blue thing and it looked cool and they bought it because of that because we influenced their their system one. I think that's very powerful, but also very like humility like humidity in a way. So yeah. that's how I how I think about this stuff. 
Yeah, I, I got to read it just because uh, Sam Sam Karen said the purpose of having a purpose simply for purpose of having a purpose serves no purpose. <laughs> thanks, thanks, Sam. Real helpful. Um, so, uh, so okay. I want to I want to make a couple of things. Make a couple of comments. I I, uh, I wholeheartedly agree with what a lot of what you're saying and what Sharp says it, on on one level. So, the level that. Um, we should be more humble about uh, as a as an industry about the power mm -hmm. of branding. I mean, there's a lot of uh, hype and dogma out there um, that is completely unfounded, right? So, uh, yeah, I mean, I know from my I think if you really if you're a rational person and you really ask yourself in your own personal life, even if you're a brand strategist and you're out there selling uh, the importance of brands, ask look around your house, ask yourself if you really know even like what these brands stand for and ask yourself if you really would spend more for a brand that had a, a purpose versus one that was half price but seemed like it was just as good i mean i don't think most of us are that righteous in our personal lives that we would that we would care right i, I know i'm not i mean i'm gonna <laughs> i'm gonna buy like the cheaper more convenient option uh if it feels like it's just as good. well i mean Amazon, why is Amazon exactly. the biggest company in the world right now? They suck at their like social, ethical, sustainable goals, everything. They just, they just don't. I mean, Bezos is uh, whatever you think of him. I, I think he's like an, an, an asshole who's really obsessed by it, whatever, but it doesn't matter. They're, they're going to be shipping in one hour in, in a year from now. And that's what, that's why they're, they're growing. And that's, Nobody on the brand side is managing that. People on the brand side are managing the smile and the fact that you immediately recognize it when it's going through the street and it stays top of mind. And even like there's there's some parts of that that are about meaning. And, and I'm not saying as a brand strategist, you're not managing meaning. I'm just saying as an output, it doesn't work that way for yeah. consumers. And that's fine. Right. Um, the The... One thing you said that I'm not sure I agree with is, um, and I don't want to get into system one, system two stuff, but, you know, I think that th those of us who think about defining what a brand stands for and trying to build some meaning into it, I, I would hope that most of us uh, that are, again, that are rational thinkers are, are not convincing ourselves or are trying to convince our clients that that's going to directly influence purchase decisions in, in that people are going to say, I'm buying this brand because they, you know, care about the planet or whatever it is. I, I think it's mm -hmm. uh, where I like to think of it is that it's um, potentially an indirect influence. And that's where you start to get back into system one. So, I mean, mm -hmm. I, I do think that on the margin, um, you know, there are brands that maybe I have a generally good feeling about versus brands that I don't. And maybe that's, and maybe that's because uh, I heard something good about them or heard something bad about them. And so uh, it, it's not necessarily that I'm thinking I'm buying this brand because of this, but I think that, um, you know, if I have the, the option between the Patagonia jacket and the uh, no name brand jacket and they're about the same price, yeah, I'm probably gonna go with Patagonia, not only because I expect it to be higher quality and I know the brand, but maybe because I feel like they have a reputation for being sort of a, a good company or something like that. So mm -hmm. that's yeah. part of it. And then I also think where the humility comes in is, is really recognizing that so much of what, if brand strategists and brand managers are playing with meaning, it is, it is what's happening on the margin, right? It's like that slight, maybe you're making a tiny little influence. Maybe you're having a less than a percent influence, but when you're talking about big numbers, hundreds of thousands, millions of customers, a, a, a half a percent can make a, a significant difference. Yeah, I, I want to present a model that that for me, like brings these different types of thinking together and that I've been using a lot, like in the last six months in strategy. And for me, it like fuses together because I think we can get in debates and semantics about what whether this stuff is true or not. But like, I really love this, this new model I've been I, it's not my model. It's a, uh, it's actually a model from uh, the people that, that uh, have like the system one thinking and it's called the, the idea of like fame, feeling and fluency. I don't know if you know those uh, three F's mm. it's, 
for me, it blends together everything we learn from Branny and Sharp in a really nice way. So fame, feeling, and fluency. And this is actually how I usually do my brand strategy work. These are like the pillars I work on. Oh, great. So this was, fame, was my question anyway, is how does it tangibly influence? Voila, I, I want to dive. Yeah, so, so fame, for like, so the, there's two levels on, on which the, this, the, these three Fs work. So first off, it's just like, when whenever you're working on a brand, it's good to assess the state of the three pillars. But then, of course, the next stage, it's about defining and setting a strategy for each of these pillars and working on how to actually achieve better results. But the first part is often assessing the state of how famous is our brand. Mm -hmm. Very simple. How well known are we? That's like, and, and that is the, the one part that is very often underestimated in the branding world is that you really need reach and broad reach and, and not just focus on, on single audiences or smaller audience. So, so fame is a very important one. And you can have fame within a certain subculture or sub niche or whatever. We can debate about that, but fame is a very important part. And, and the interesting thing is that fame leads to the more famous you are, the more familiar you are, and the more easily you're purchased you are. So fame is a very logical thing. And, and the next F is feeling. And that is like, what do people feel? Do they feel positive, negative? Do they feel happy, excited? Do they feel whatever with your brand? It does matter on certain levels it's not like what i like about feeling is it's not meaning i mean it's feeling what you said like maybe having like patagonia gives me an outdoorsy feeling and sure enough there's a sustainable message behind it that after a while gives me that outdoors feeling so that's what you said about meaning creating feeling after a while and i agree on that level so feeling what are people feeling about this brand but if Let's say if feeling is, is negative and fame is high, you've got a little bit of a problem, but it's easier to be fixed because you're already familiar. You just need to work on upside. And actually, they have a case study on Volkswagen where they show that Volkswagen had a lot of fame, but very negative feelings, but they managed to turn it around quickly because the feeling and the fame are really interconnected with each other. And that's what a lot of people like underestimate the importance of reach and being very famous. So, and that's why a lot of like, I mean, crappy songs that go viral, <laughs> like we can discuss about the quality of those songs, but they, that, that's like the interesting about fame. Like it's like an, like a flywheel that keeps on going in a way. And that, that's why these two are very, yeah. It becomes so fame, a fulfilling prophecy sort of, and, and I get it. Yeah. Like, well, Mark Ritson had that comment the other day about uh, Facebook and how people don't trust Facebook. That trust people say, but they're famous for brands. But yeah, there are so many brands that we deal with sort of begrudgingly, um, but we spend a ton of money and time with them, right? Facebook. You mentioned Amazon, uh, tel like telcos, right? In, in the U.S., mm -hmm. everyone hates Verizon and Comcast, but we all deal with it because we need cable and internet in our homes. So yeah, and and they're they're physically available, and and like the, I think that's also a written comment, but like you're not gonna drive around the block to get another soda if if it's not in the the fridge of the store you're at at that time at that point, and that's physical availability. But it's probably definitely something branding people don't consider it's also not their job because it's a marketing like objective uh, so you have place promotion place uh price these things really matter but they also matter for brand but not gonna get into that now um but i that's that's it. so fame feeling very important things to think about and of course managing feeling and, and in influencing feeling is in part visual communication in part verbal communication in part sonic whatever you want to do and a big part of it is of course like if volkswagen fucks up in their cars it's not going to matter whether you change the color on the branding level or not but again we, we can get into that um fluency is the last pillar of that of those three so fame feeling fluency and fluency is about how easy can you read and recognize the brand and that's a big part where branding, of course, lift is like uh, the codes that we have, the easy, the recognizability of the, this is basically what Jenny Romania calls distinctive brand assets mm -hmm. and how you can assess the state of these assets, which assets are easily recognized, which assets are like 
distinct enough from the competitor and that sort of stuff. So doing an assessment on those three levels and defining a strategy that will influence all three of those is like already a great way to to take into consideration all of the stuff that behavioral science and that that sharp and, and and all of these laws have told us because they keep in consideration all of these elements and that's what i try to keep in mind and i can give you some examples of like on the research part in brand strategy what that implicates what it, what that implicates is when let's say you're doing a scan of Facebook pages and you're looking at the messages there these different brands have so you're you're writing down the different messages they have you're looking at the visual side you're looking at the logos that's where most branding people will stop because they're looking at meaning and maybe also the visual part what you should also be looking at is the part about reach about fame because these things are not separated from each other and so what i usually do is i look at for example let's say i look at facebook ads library how much are they spending on on marketing you can do that on a facebook level you can do that on different levels and i've had cases i can't go into detail because i'm under ndas but i've had a lot of cases where you can actually just map the like the spending with the popularity and even the positive sentiment of the brand. So basically meaning the more they spend, the more positive they are perceived, the more trustworthy they are perceived. Sure. So you see what I'm saying? Again, this is this is the idea of that double jeopardy law where it's like big is more trustworthy, is bought more often. And so that really does matter. Like if we are going to be more available, we're going to be more trustworthy. And so the solution is not always, yeah, we need to change our message. We need to change the way we approach. Sometimes it's just, the answer is just spend more. And that's of course, not a, not a great tagline for branding agencies yeah, because what we <laughs> always spend more. <laughs> that's always, exactly. That's always but, but spend end. more, spend, spend more on what i mean that's that's i've been in a lot of instances where i saw that the solution was not doing a rebrand but doing better marketing maybe like i've been in situations where i said like you just need to be in more stores that's going to probably solve a lot of this problem but where they said like yeah we're not resonating with our audience we need to attract more gen z whatever the hell is going on in that brief and Obviously, that's fun and there's a lot of money to be made there. But in a lot of cases, it's just flawed thinking because we all believe, and the biggest problem is on the client side, we also believe that humans are these really like meaningful creatures that buy because they, and, and that's where a lot of these flaws come from, that it's like this more mechanical big scope thing going on. And yeah. I think by analyzing fame, fleeting, and fluency, at least you're keeping in consideration a little bit more than just the the meaning part. So a couple of quick questions. Um, the, the I love this, the fame, feeling, fluency model. Where can we find it? Who, whose is it? Or is it a book or a, an article? Yeah, it's a, I don't have a laptop with me. It's If you look system one and then feeling fame fluency you'll find like a they have like a pdf that's floating around on the internet and i'll make sure to share it with you so you can share it with your audiences awesome. but it's it's floating around on the internet got it but that's that's the system i really like it how do you measure so i, I can kind of gather i think how you would measure fame and feeling because those are you know pretty standard there are all kinds of approaches to, that uh, you know i'm sure can be improved upon but i think as, as marketing and brand people we've all tried to measure those things in some way but but how do you measure mm -hmm. fluency or is that more where you yep. are, where your sort of expert opinion comes in just looking at what they're doing and saying, here's what I think. It, it depends on, on to, uh, on the budget, of course. So if, and also the scale, if it's like, let's say a small local business and they don't have much fame or even assets, like it's, there's no use in doing quantitative surveys, but once it's at a certain scale, it becomes interesting to dissect the codes, show them to people and ask them what brand comes up. Wow. And that's where you really, you really have the distinctive brand assets grid by Jenny Romaniak. That's just a perfect 
way of testing things, whether they're famous and whether they're unique, like you can score them on both. And the assets that are both famous and unique are the ones you want to keep. And then the assets that are maybe unique but not famous are the ones you can maybe push okay. in advertising, in, in stores, whatever you want to do. And then on the left side, you just want to steer clear of, of assets. And that's the, 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 uh, the quadrant on the left, famous assets that are not unique. I can tell you like 99% of all rebrands I see, the assets live in that quadrant. It's like really cool typographic sans serif logos that are not unique, not distinctive. This is what we're doing as branding agencies. We're, we're just, we're basically screwing our clients. And, mm -hmm. and that's where I can get a little bit <laughs> like angry about this stuff because the science is telling us other stuff and we're just throwing it away because why do yeah. these things come up? Because we want them to be like, there's a whole narrative about the personality and the meaning. And that's why we come up with the same result every time. But that's a problem for me. Right. Well, it's, I think the biggest problems, uh, 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 tell me if I'm misinterpreting what you're saying, but unnecessary rebranding, right, is a huge waste of money on, yep. for the client and unethical potentially for, for branding firms to be pushing. And then not only mm -hmm. the rebrand, but then the rebrand that follows trends is going to not only, uh, you know, waste a lot of money potentially, but also uh, create assets for them that are not distinctive because they're following the trend. So the GMF exactly sans serif uh, word mark logos that everybody else in the industry has potentially, you know, uh, and, and, and the, the, sorry to interrupt you there, but the irony is, and that's what I like, I can get really like, I can almost had my bang my head against the wall. Like we're, we are, branding people like we this is our job to make sure that at least visually we can distinct one company for another right i mean that's the, the the core level what branding you know when they used to brand cows it was so you could see that's cow from owner a and that's cow from owner b that's the most basic level and that's what we really need to do but by going beyond that and learning about meaning and somewhere along the way we lost this like primary function of hey can we recognize this company because we're so like turned into this idea of like what we need to create this narrative and and like i get it i really get it and i was there and i've done these things but i do think like a little bit more of a hybridness and and getting these nuances would really help and benefit our industry. But you don't think those ranchers had like a piece of paper with their brand personality and their brand values on it, and that's how they design <laughs> it. <laughs> they had they had a lot of onions, but yeah, not on paper. Yeah, right. Not, not <laughs> brand um, that actually that actually does kind of lead me to my next question. So you mentioned before that um, that Byron Sharp his work doesn't sort of denigrate branding. It actually says branding is maybe even more important than, than you thought it was, or it's very important. Um, yep. And yeah, he says that in his book too, right? But, but he, he always says branding, not brand strategy, right? So my question is, what does it mean for brand strategy? And I, I mean, I wonder if Byron Sharps even sort of thinks that's a thing. Like, what is it? Because everything that you're talking about, it feels very tied to distinctive assets, mostly visual, but mm -hmm. of course, other senses as well. And I get that you can think strategically about that, right? You can make sure your logo doesn't look like everybody else's logo. But the industry, quote unquote, of brand strategy has really been built around things like brand positioning and these brand platforms that do include things like a brand essence, a brand personality, brand values, brand pillars. To what degree do you feel like, I'm not even gonna ask you whether how much of that you feel like is BS, but do you do any of that with your clients? Like, what do you do with clients aside from that three F's model? What do you provide mm -hmm. to them that you say, this is your brand strategy? Because um, I, I gather that it used to be probably something more in that brand platform, brand on a page thing, be, maybe before you started learning all the brand sharp stuff. Is it something else now? It, it's, it's definitely a, like a, a hybrid model where like, some of the old stuff still floats around and and like i want i there's this interesting thing about positioning for example what i really like about i learned this from from jp castlin uh he's like a really you know maybe you know him but he's a really interesting guy and and like he once told me like positioning 
how the 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 big role of positioning is to like cut meeting times and i really believe that like it's it's the the if you have like a, a, a your positioning honed in it it's like it there's so many useless debates that go out of the table like it, knowing at least where you stand in the market and what you want to stand for and all that stuff so i still do positioning exercises but i'm not for example in a positioning exercise i'm not hung up about finding a blue ocean space or a unique gap i'm just hung up on finding the positioning that works for this company and what they believe in because i know it once we have that down it's off the table and we don't need to discuss about it so it's more of like almost like a like a practical thing of putting that in the sand but i used to be like pushing on like yeah but this is not differentiating like is our consumers gonna find this differentiating and that's where i let go of that idea of of differentiation so positioning yes the way i do it is different the nuance is different give, um sorry give, give me an example of a of a position or a positioning just to make sure we're speaking the same page because they're speaking the same language because I feel like that word has taken on a lot of meaning that probably wasn't originally intended over the past few decades. Yeah. So when you, when you say you try to help a brand find a positioning, what might that be? Like, what's an example? Yeah. You know, what's funny, like my positioning axis used to be, um, used to be quadrant, like uh, line up and down, line left and right, and then like find the gap somewhere. Yeah most of my positioning exercises now are there's one line and we're talking about let's say cheap or expensive or some kind of thing specific to the context sustainable not sustainable whatever whatever it is it's like very just on very obvious things and I, usually i'm like positioning the brand i'm working for in the middle which is really interesting because like it used to be on the we need to pick a side yeah, and what's really interesting right corner, right, yeah, of that yeah. well what i'm what i'm finding now it's very interesting to find like positionings that can that that are hybrid that can own multiple positions and and like that's a you can get into a whole discussion about that but it, the thing is like again it's about not being hung up and being understanding of of both the constraints within the company but also in the market and yeah, I, I'm, I know I'm not sounding very clear right now. So I'm, I'm thinking of a more clear way to think about these things. The problem is like each time I do positioning, it's, it's really so dependent on the market. Like I recently did an exercise on positioning where it was a market that had basically all the players had the same kind of messaging and stuff like that. And my positioning axis was like, we, we can, the opportunity in the market is to have a more distinctive branding, for example, which is again, like a very basic exercise. But these, these are the kind of lines I want to draw in the sand. And again, I want to go back to JP. I, I like to call, I like to think of positioning as defining the sandbox mm -hmm. rather than, than defining the position within the sandbox so for me it's more like having old boundaries and showing where we live within those boundaries but understanding that after that that there can be a lot of room to play with and i think brands need like that flexibility and need that platform rather than need that unique position because they might shift i mean again look at bra like a brand like apple that has shifted so much in terms of how they do things and how they how they communicate and stuff like that if if like if a brand branding person that really believes in what he does would be at the head of of apple and they would stick to the core then they would be not so profitable today so that's where i see positioning again as like a sandbox maybe you want to ask a, a question that makes it more clear because i, I know i'm rambling on right now <laughs> no. so, I, mean, I, I guess it's just worth kind of reminding people the the origin of the 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 origin of positioning as kind of a marketing or advertising concept as far as i know comes from from al reese and uh al reese, yeah. about right in the, the yeah. early 80s maybe even late 70s um a book called positioning the battle for your mind and 
And I mean, I, I do think it's worth remembering these guys were advertising guys. Uh, you know, the idea of branding or brand strategy wasn't really uh, popularized yet. Um, positioning was, I think, a little bit at the beginning of that. Um, but if you go back to what they said, I mean, they're really talking about owning an idea in the mind, right? Or, or finding kind of a, a, a gap um, that, that's not owned by, by other organizations. And I get that some of what you're saying is maybe that maybe that some of that doesn't doesn't seem to make sense based on Sharp's research and Aaron Burgas Institute's research. But I also feel like, you know, some of their original examples were like uh, the classic example is uh, uh, Volvo is the safe the safe uh, vehicle, right? Um, but it, even... it's true. But Vol Volvo today is is a lot more like for honing in on on sustainability and and like doing a lot of different things, and they have. But but I mean. In a way, you're right, but in a way, I think also when people go out to buy a Volvo and you would ask them why you're buying a Volvo, they, they, they wouldn't say it's about safety per se, all of them. I'm not sure. No, but you're right. It, I mean, I because mean, if, you, if you look at the data, they're not, they're not the safest cars necessarily either. So. No, no, but, but uh, Ritson, Ritson said a really good quote on it, and I love Ritson again because he's always bridging gaps. And like his, yeah. his idea is actually, he, he co coined the idea of bothism, mm -hmm. which is like, yes, differentiation and yes, distinctiveness instead of like going, saying it's one or the other. And he said like, it's, it, I think it's, he said relative differentiation. So what that means is in relation to its market share, all of these brands score pretty high on safety, but uh, Volvo might slightly score more on safety, but it's again, it's still in relationship to the market share. So that's interesting where, it's not a unique ownable attribute that sticks in the mind just for that brand. It's more to the category. And that leads us back to the, this idea of like category entry points where it's like, can you own more than one? That's actually quite interesting. And I had this conversation with uh, Brandon Shockley on my podcast last week, really smart guy. Yeah. And he said, we see, um, we see brand like brand positioning as I'm thinking of the metaphor he used. It was like, oh, yeah, I think it was um, a card game like poker where it's like you're waiting for that one card to win the game, like the, the, the ace, the, the, the whatever. That's how people usually see positioning, like waiting for this unique thing that, that blows up the game. And he says it's a game of monopoly. You need to own as much mm -hmm. streets as you can. And that's a that's like an interesting thing, but it's like really hard for us branding people because we're thinking about simplifying and converging and clarifying. And, and in a way, that's still what we need to do. But sometimes there can be layers where, for example, you say, these are the domains we want to like play on. And this is the one singular promise we're going to make that that can live on all of these domains. So that's for me a very important thing. There's a difference between saying we're going to have a single promise that tags to a single domain, or we're going to have a promise that can live on different domains. There's still this, this need for clarifying a brand. And this is still a lot of what I do with my clients. For example, because you asked that question, brand architecture is still a very um, important part of what I do. Looking at the brand portfolio, look, making sure if everything connects and like, what's the flywheel? Like, how, why is this brand existing and how is it leading to the, to the whole uh, business strategy? So brand architecture, but also brand definition, at least getting a, a decent understanding of what is the brand promise and, and that sort of stuff. It still matters. What I'm not like, what I'm not investing as much time in as I used to is going all crazy about what's the unique differentiating value value proposition we have. That's where I, I like I kind of let go of that stuff. It's less important. Or I also don't spend as much time as, for example, defining uh, tone of voice in the traditional way because I often see like it's the the same output is always yeah we need to be authentic and and whatever and witty and honest and whatever the, the same book. What I do do is, for example, what I love again about JP Gas is boundaries, and that can happen visually, uh, tonally. For example, I said certain words that can be used and certain words that can never be used. Yeah. But those are like more like, again, the idea of sandboxing, wherein people can really do a lot of stuff and you, you let it 
to brand managers and social media managers and, and advertising peeps to do what they want with the brand instead of like saying this is where it stops this is the brand and, and everybody else needs to follow this stuff got it um we're, we're coming up on on time stuff so i just i want to get to one question in the audience here uh if you can give a quick try to give a quick answer i don't know if it's a quick answer question but um mb jacob is asking how do you use cep's category entry points for positioning do you use them to inform your axis or do you uh or do you base exclusively based on the competitors you identified from your audience research so what yes interesting question uh what i usually do with cep's uh category entry points so basically for people that haven't heard of these things it's just ways in which people come into contact with the category so these can be questions like where where are they when they want to buy or use the category with who are they um when are they there why are they there like very basic that you're at the beach so maybe you're thirsty and you want a coca-cola you're you're driving and uh, uh, along to to france and maybe you want to grab a coca-cola along the way these are all different category entry points and so basically what what i usually do is i at least get in, try to get an understanding of what are the general category entry points for this category, meaning how and when do people want to come in contact with this uh, category. So let's say I'm, I'm working for flooring, which I am right now. Um, when do people think about having a new floor? Like what, what's, what's happening? Okay, so maybe they bought a new home or maybe they're redecorating or maybe they're doing something else. So there's a bunch of different things. And the traditional branding mantra would say, pick one and then build your whole proposition around it and then niche down on that and get a loyal following to buy you because you're the one that has that one point. The, the new methodology or the one I work on is trying to find a, a, a promise that works for all of these, but uh, that wasn't the question. So what I do is I list, I try to, to get a list of all the category points that exist. And then I, I do like an overlay of what are the, the, the strengths and qualities and the, also maybe the downsides and the constraints we have as a company, knowing our product, our business strategy. And then you can start to see when you overlay those two, there's probably a few CEPs or category entry points that you can own or work on more easily than others. And so you basically just put those together and you see, okay, so these, four are really good but you also it's not just the company constraints it's also the competitor or the category constraints so seeing what other uh, players are really good at owning certain category points and putting all of those layering all of those things together will give you like certain highlights and those will be the foundation for you to work on and build on and expand on in the future awesome. and this sounds very vague <laughs> no, I think, um, didn't Roma doesn't Romaniac have a, a great example of, of sort of finding an untapped category entry point that the competitors aren't talking about and actually sort of positioning the brand around, I think it was something like we're, we're the, the biscuit to eat with, with your morning coffee or something like that. And, exactly. Yeah, so realizing that nobody, that that's, a, that's an entry point for biscuits or cookies as we call them in the U.S., um, but that nobody's really owning that. So that's a way we could maybe yeah. not position and our brand, but that's an entry point we could kind of own. The, the, that's, that's the interesting where, again, like this, it's, it's often semantic discussions, category entry points, like positioning. But what I really like about, again, category entry points is you're really aligning yourself with the consumer and looking from outside to the category and then trying to understand like what's the one that we can work on or what are multiple ones we can work work on based on what we know about ourselves and, and the category and consumer. And, and the interesting is you're less hung up about it being uniquely special or differentiated. You're just more practically thinking about, yeah. oh yeah, that's one we can definitely own because the cookie works well in the morning 
and our brand is already has this atmosphere. And then maybe we can start thinking about maybe the other cookie in, in the afternoon, but that's like a different story. And But it's really, again, that idea of not being hung up about it being that uniquely differentiated, meaningfully differentiated brand, and more about just understanding how are we going to fit in people's lives on an unconscious level and maybe on a meaningful level, but that's maybe not the core of it all. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks, Steph, again for your time. That kind of brings the conversation full circle. Before I let you go, is there anything, um, I know you're, you've been teaching these uh, courses. You've got a couple of new courses online, one on research. Yep. Where, where can people go to learn more about that? Is there anything yep. like coming up that you're excited about that you want to tell people about? Yeah. So, I think the biggest thing, um, if people are more interested in learning about how to understand consumer category, all of this stuff, culture, quantitative surveys, brand tracking, tracking awareness, fame, full feeling, fluency, all of this stuff, which is basically the foundation for brand strategy and branding after, uh, go check out brandstrategyresearch.com. You'll find my uh, first two modules are live there and you can uh, just tag along that course. And I'm actually building on like a bigger class, which is the nice. Brand Builder Master class, which is like multiple modules, brand strategy, fundamentals, research, and so on. And so get started on that. Uh, get in now, as I would say, and then uh, we can solve bigger problems together. Sounds awesome. Congrats on getting that URL. It was brandstrategyresearch.com, right? Exactly. All right. All right. I'll check it out. I hope everybody else checks it out too. Thanks again for your time. Have a great night and uh, I'll talk again soon, I hope. Thanks, Rob. Thanks for having me. This was fun. All right. Bye, Steph. Cheers. Have a great day.